kind of interacting together. There's going to be some interactive components, so happy to see that you all are very lively today. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. I'm super delighted to be a part of this conference and give a talk on my introductory discussion on functional juniors leveling up your new Elixir devs. Like I mentioned, um, before you get to know me and before we start talking about the purpose of this talk, I want to make it a little interactive with some trivia questions. To incentivize your participation, I brought some rubber duckies that you'll get if you answer correctly. And if you answer incorrectly, then you still get a duck. I just get to fast pitch it at your head. <laughs> I'm kidding, kind of. Please raise your hand if you know the answer to any of these questions. When was the first Elixir conference held? Yeah. I'm going to throw it. But if this doesn't work out, we're just at the end. Y'all are going to come get your ducks. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> A little too strong. <laughs> My aim will get better with uh, the questions. <laughs> Where was the first Elixir conference held? Raise your hand. Austin, yeah. Here's this. There we go. <laughs> Who were the original developers of, er of Erlang? Um, you just need to name one of the three. Yeah. Do you want pink or green? Green. Nice. <laughs> There's still two more, so anybody have a guess on the other two Erlang developers? Yeah. Nice. And one more? Anybody? Lee? There's no way I can toss this duck to you. So you <laughs> nice. Nice. <laughs> What syntax makes an anonymous function in Elixir different from a regular function? Yeah. Oh, you get the cool and you get the Minecraft duck. Elixir allows you to manage your application's dependencies using a dedicated tool. What is the name of this tool? Yeah. <laughs> Two more questions. What does the def keyword stand for in Elixir? Define, definition, you know, that's fine. We'll give it to him. <laughs> the last one's really obscure, so maybe I'll give you two ducks if you get this one. Which Elixir function can be used to calculate the Levenstein distance between two strings? Anyone? Anybody? <laughs> no? Any guesses? You still get a duck if you guess. What is it? Nope, but here you go. <laughs> uh, it's string dot jaro distance. I actually didn't know this before I found this question, so you all learned something new. The reason I chose to open this talk with a bit of trivia is because it relates to our main topic. No matter how easy or how obscure these questions were, you learn the answer somewhere along the way. When you learn something, there's often a dedicated process behind it, pun intended. Learning processes refer to the various ways in which we acquire, assimilate, and retain new information or skills. Listing off factual information like we just did could mean you acquire that information via a process called rote learning. While there are many different varieties of learning processes, there are a few that are most commonly found to be utilized by software engineers. Throughout this talk, we'll cover a few of these processes and how you can utilize them to level up your skills as a software engineer. Towards the end of this talk, you'll be given two roadmaps, one for engineering managers and another for new Elixir devs. These roadmaps will help you apply the learning processes that work best for you and your team into actionable experiences. I hope you enjoy the talk and walk away with some new tips and resources. If not, I have more ducks. OK. So before we dive in, I'd like for us to become better acquainted by allowing me to share my journey in becoming an Elixir developer. My name is Savannah, and I'm predominantly a self-taught dev, but I did graduate in 2017 with an unrelated degree from Georgia Southern University. 
During this time, I became an avid rock climber and started taking trips locally, then internationally to climbing destinations. I discovered that I really enjoyed teaching people rock climbing skills and taking friends at multi-pitch climbs. So shortly after graduating, I did what most 22-year-olds do. I set up shop as the proud founder of an international rock climbing guide company. I acquired a business license, secured insurance, received a guide certification, and took a nice looking pitch deck to an outdoor conference similar to this and convinced a few big brands to support the beginnings of my company financially and with equipment. A few months later, I was running my first trips in Chattanooga, Tennessee. The main mission of my company was to empower women through the sport of rock climbing. And we were very successful at this. We had many repeat clients and eventually extended our trips to international zones like El Petro Chico in northern Mexico and Mallorca, Spain, a little island off the coast of Barcelona with turquoise beaches and endless Spanish wine. These are some photos from the, uh, some of the trips that I took. I did this for about four years until COVID hit and put the world on lockdown. Prior to COVID, I already felt like I wanted to make a potential career switch. Owning my own company was great, but I've always wanted to go back to academia. Not wanting to take on more student loan debt, I thought about career paths that incorporated continuous education, but it still allowed me a great degree of creative freedom. While traveling, I often noticed many rock climbers held the profession of software engineer. Perhaps it's because it balances out the physical, physical fatigue with the mental fatigue, or most likely because it's a job that can be held remotely and climbers can be closer to climbing. Whatever the reason, after chatting with a few friends, I became determined to be a software engineer and a self-taught one of that. For about a year and a half, I ran my company in self-taught SE principles, quickly picking up JavaScript and building small applications. I utilized every resource recommended to me, went to meetups, took advantage of free pair programming events, and consistently attended talks and presentations on complex SE topics. I also interviewed at 10 different boot camps. I did this not because I necessarily wanted to get into these boot camps, but because each one had a different level of skill required to be accepted. And almost all of them required some kind of technical interview where they gave you feedback. I wrote a blog on Medium about this, so if you want to read more, then you can check that out. Eventually, I was able to freelance my skills out on mostly React Native projects until I landed my first full-time SE position at Iconic Moments, which is where I currently work and is mainly responsible as to why I'm here today, because the hiring requirement was that I had to learn Elixir. I didn't know much about Elixir at the time, but was a fan of functional paradigms, so I was intrigued, to, I was intrigued enough to accept, and I'm super happy I did, because going from JavaScript to Elixir is like upgrading from a push mower to a 360-degree turn radius motorized lawnmower. I couldn't think of a better comparison at the time, so this is what you get. <laughs> a bit more about Iconic Moments. They're an NFT marketplace for museums and cultural institutions. We partner directly with these entities to sell artwork on their behalf and help them generate revenue. When COVID hit, anything that gained the majority of their revenue from in-person attendance suffered financially. Iconic Moments was born from this need and is growing successfully with every new NFT release, often with a utility attached. Here's a photo from our latest drop featuring Jackson Pollock. All purchasers received a real art print along with their NFT. We use Elixir throughout many of our repos. To give you an example of some of the types of projects I worked on, I'll, sh I'll show you a side project I made um, for fun with my co-speaker, Gabe Lemunyu, who is obviously not here today. He had some visa issues, so you just get me. We built a small project called ESPY. ESPY is a real-time NFT tracker. The user provides a contract address and token ID they want to track. And then ESPY returns the movement of the NFT from one address to the next. If you're familiar with OpenSea at all, it's super similar to their activity section. SB uses the information the user provides to make remote procedural calls to the Ethereum blockchain. It pulls the blockchain every five seconds for a block count update and checks to see if the requested address exists in its transaction history. If it does, then it looks for the token ID and transfer method. I'll give you a quick diagram of what's going on in this application. We have two main parts, our worker and our business context. In our worker, we manually set a start for the start block for the tracker to begin pulling transactions from. The worker iterates through the blocks until it's caught up with the most recent one. 
By leveraging the power of OTP and the Ethereum vir virtual machine to trace NFTs between wallets, we were able to create a GIN server that pulled the Ethereum blockchain in search of criteria that matched a contract address and token ID. Some more specifics of this is we used a JSON RPC to grab our transactions from the EVM and outsourced to Infura as our light client to make requests. Unfortunately, we didn't have the resources or power to run our archival node. For those unfamiliar with blockchain technology, it essentially means having access to the entire chain's history. But Infura works great for a small demo, which gives us access to the latest transactions on the chain. This is a screenshot of our homepage. And when you click Submit, you're routed to the correlating NFT tracker page with the populated data. We have an additional feature added that will give you real-time notifications. So we actually presented this entire project at the Lisbon um, Elixir EU conference this past year. So if you're curious how this project kind of works under the hood, um, the whole talk is about that. This talk is not entirely about this. Back to my journey on uh, Elixir. It's exciting to build tools like this and especially fun to do so in Elixir. I'm so incredibly grateful to Iconic Moments for not only being a wonderful place to work as my first full-time job as an SE, but also for the seniors who assisted in my learning efforts and the prior CTO, Gregory Ostermeyer, who introduced me to Elixir. I'll mention a few specifics I felt like they did a really great job of. Right when I was hired, they provided me an, ed an education stipend for me to attend conferences, buy books and other learning materials, and designated time on the job for me to be able to digest and learn from these resources. They continued to help me solidify my knowledge by pairing me with our CS graduate intern and having me teach her concepts as we built larger features together. Another thing they did that I appreciated was how they weren't afraid to give me important tasks right out the gate that utilized aspects of my direct learning and allowed me to take ownership in my work and contribute to the team. The commitment my team made to ramping me up in a positive way in the industry and giving me plenty of space to learn a new language like Elixir has encouraged my competency as a dev and fueled my own curiosity, which has led me to speaking up at conferences like this. To encourage new devs to take on a new language, hopefully Elixir, and realize, much, realize how much fun it is when you pair quality of learning and proper resources together. So now we're going to return to something that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, learning processes. Like I mentioned, there are many of them, and each of them are well-researched theories and learning and could be an entire talk on their own. So for brevity, I'm going to give you an overview of four of them that are commonly found in software engineering. The first one we're going to discuss is problem-based learning. This involves solving complex problems, whether in coding, architecture, or design. PBL isn't your typical sit and listen method like passive styles of learning can be. Instead, it's an active learning approach designed to immerse you in real world problem solving. This often involves the application of theoretical concepts to practical situations, and that's where the magic happens. Bridging the gap between what you learn in theory and how you can actually use it in practice. Some examples are leak coding, debugging, and feature building. A common practice of problem-based learning is collaboration, which leads us to our next process, collaborative learning. This is exactly what it sounds like. Collaborative learning is performed in team efforts, meaning working on group projects, pair programming, and code reviews. There's often a common goal to achieve whether that be solving a problem or thinking up new ideas or approaches. This process emphasizes active participation, communication, and mutual support among group members. Some important benefits are a deeper understanding of diverse perspectives, meaning it exposes learners to different viewpoints and thought processes, reflection on the effectiveness of strategies used, and the quality of outcomes achieved. Conflict resolution. When people work together, conflicts might arise, and this provides opportunities to develop conflict resolution and negotiation skills. The next process is self-directed learning. Self-directed learning is a process in which individuals take the initiative and responsibility for planning, executing, and evaluating their own learning experiences. Learners are actively engaged in identifying their learning needs, setting goals, choosing resources, and monitoring their progress. This approach emphasizes autonomy, self-motivation, and the ability to manage one's own learning journey. Often in software engineering, we like to categorize ourselves into the self-taught versus bootcamp versus traditional CS degree. But if you're an actively participating SE, then you'll at some point undoubtedly have used this learning style to teach yourself new concepts, frameworks, languages, or tools. 
While all three of these have some overlap with each other, our last process is really a combination of all of these. Experiential learning. In its simplest definition, it's learning by doing. It's a hands-on approach where you learn through direct experience and reflection on what you've done. But I'm quite fond of this definition defined by Keaton and Tate in 1978. Learning in which the learner is directly in touch with the realities being studied. It is contrasted with learning in which the learner only reads about, hears about, talks about, or writes about these realities, but never comes into contact with them as part of the learning process. It involves, it involves direct encounter with the phenomenon being studied rather than merely thinking about the encounter or only considering the possibility of doing something with it. In software engineering, this isn't just number of years, but the amount of quality or impactful experiences the SE has had within those years. Some characteristics or other processes that involve an experiential learning process are project-based learning, for an example, a full-stack web application that involves designing, developing, and deploying the software to provide the learner with a comprehensive understanding of the software development lifecycle. Error analysis, learners encounter errors and bugs which provide valuable learning opportunities. They learn to diagnose issues, troubleshoot problems, and optimize code. Real-world application. This direct engagement with real-world tasks helps learners bridge the gap between theoretical concepts and practical implementation while providing applicable examples. Now, for something I promised you earlier on in this talk, deliverables. At the company I work at, my seniors, whether intentionally or unintentionally, followed quite a few of these processes, as I mentioned before. The projects I was assigned to and how I went about them really contributed to my growth as a dev. Pulling from these experiences, I'd like to offer all the engineering managers a roadmap. Can you raise your hand if you're an engineering manager in here? A few of you? Cool. So this is for you. The first thing on this roadmap is testing. Let it crash. While phrases like this have fallen out of fashion, there's something to be said about trusting your system. And a great way to do this is via testing. Speaking on newer devs in general, they can be greatly concerned about leaving production in shambles or nervous that they might break something. So give your newcomers space to fail, space to take chances, to be random, to poke things, move them around, and to be curious. Allow them to test. The first six months of my current job, I was given a heavy dose of this. I tested a ton, and this was a great job for junior devs, as it not only improves the quality of your code base, but also allows them to learn and discover the true functionality of the code, just like I did. It allows them to, quick, uh, it allows them to be a quickly contributing member of the team. Next up is ownership. Research suggests that being given individual responsibility and autonomy can lead to increased performance and motivation. This concept is often referred to as the autonomy effect or the empowerment effect. This idea has been supported by studies and test cases such as Google's 20% time policy. Google is famous for allowing its employees to dedicate 20% of their work time to pursue personal projects. This policy has re resulted in several successful products, including Gmail. Atlassian has ship it days, which allow employees 24 hours to work on any project they choose. This policy has also led to, de to the development of new features and tools, fostering a culture of innovation. This can also take form in assigned projects. My company had me build a full stack web app and deploy it. Uh, I'd been given many different features to work on previous this, but this one was exciting because it was entirely my own. I also spoke directly with our CEO to decide on a design and discuss specific functionality and then brought it to life. Has anyone played Zahata or not Prawn? Anybody? No? Well, you should. They're really fun. They're really old. Um, the project was a type of riddles game akin to these two old games, but with a slightly more updated UI. While not the most difficult thing I've ever worked on, it leveled up my skills in live view and made me feel like my thoughts and expertise were highly valued. An entire full stack app might be somewhat impossible to achieve in larger companies, but small features or optimization can have the same effect on an individual. The point is, don't be afraid to give your new devs more responsibility. Next stop on our roadmap, encourage community involvement. One of the best things I've discovered about Elixir is that it has a very passionate community. 
The language itself is built by the people's majority wants and needs, not a corporate organization. So the language and tools built from it get a lot of love. You'll find conferences like this held all over the world that are specific to Elixir. It's also common to find Elixir-specific groups and meetups in major cities or virtual ones online that meet regularly. This means there's ample opportunity for your new Elixir devs to get involved and become inspired to maybe contribute to the language or to just become a better Elixir engineer in general. Community is important for so many reasons, like knowledge sharing. Elixir is rapidly evolving and has many contributors, so send your new devs off into the world to see what's brewing. All this to say, give your new devs a proper budget and time to attend community events like this one. And the last stop on the roadmap, hire all of your devs and intern to teach. OK, so maybe this is a bit overkill. But learning by teaching falls under the broader umbrella of experiential learning because it involves active engagement, practical application, and reflection on the learning process. When you teach someone else, you're not only sharing information, but you're also reinforcing your own understanding of the subject matter. This process requires you to organize your thoughts, clarify concepts, and anticipate questions, all of which contribute to a deeper level of understanding. Additionally, teaching others allows you to observe their reactions and adjust your explanations based on their feedback, further enhancing your ability to communicate and convey complex ideas. So while you might not have the budget to give everyone a buddy intern, make time at regular intervals to allow your new Elixir devs to teach each other, or if there aren't many new devs, you can even substitute a non-dev person. Even complex things can be explained like your five, I thought this was funny. I saw this on Reddit. Um, and that's it for the engineering managers. You may all leave. Your talking points are over. <laughs> I'm going to focus the last bit of this talk on a roadmap specifically for new Elixir devs in the house. For you, this means resources. In some languages, like Python and JavaScript, there's no lack of abundance when it comes to resources. For a more niche language, like Elixir, the resources are more scarce. However, in the past few years, the interest in Elixir has increased, and with that, so have the amount of resources. Elixir devs tend to be really passionate about their language, and because of that, we have an array of quality, well-thought-out materials to learn from. You'll find that many of the resources I picked are books because I learn really well through reading, uh, through reading through concepts and then applying them. Although, you'll find the entirety of VARC represented here. A quick side note on VARC, I'm sure you all know what it is. Uh, they're pretty self-explanatory and essentially means uh, verbal, auditory, reading, writing, kinesthetic. While I'm not going to give you another lecture on learning processes, I will uh, kind of tell you the difference between learning processes and learning styles. Learning processes pertain to the cognitive and metacognitive activities individuals use to learn, emphasizing the how of learning and the how knowledge is, um, and how knowledge is acquired and processed. Learning styles, on the other hand, is a theory that categorizes learners based on their preferred sensory modalities for processing information. It suggests that some people have dominant learning styles, such as visual, auditory, reading, writing, or kinesthetic, and they learn best when information is presented in their preferred style. We're going to start with syntax. Has anybody read The Joy of Learning or picked it up before? Anyone? You have? One of you. Uh, so I really like this book. It's a really gentle introduction to Elixir concepts with a heavy emphasis on syntax. Um, reasons I love this book as your first intro to Elixir. Uh, the excerpt says it all. Joy of Elixir avoids assuming you know anything about programming while teaching you about your first programming language. Elixir was my second programming language, and I really appreciated how this book didn't leave me questioning ideas or concepts presented and fo focused mainly on helping me adjust to the syntax. The author does an excellent job of keeping the examples and lexicon quite concise and simple throughout the book, leaving the reader feeling encouraged uh, to continue building on this knowledge. If you are interested in it, then this is a link. You can get a free version by going to his website. Moving on to the basics, I have a few recommendations in this area that are community driven. The first is Elixir School. The lessons in Elixir School solidify your previous exposure to the Elixir language and help you get your first glimpse at Elixir in action. The lessons they cover go more in depth than the joy of Elixir and give you the tools you need to begin plugging together small applications and build on your leak coding IEX sessions. 
This pairs super well with the OG Getting Started Guide on ElixirLang.org. I also love Elixir School for its blog and Today I Learned sections. I often find these articles popping up when I have a very Elixir-specific problem. I also encourage you to post your own thoughts as you learn more. Another resource on our roadmap that is really in between the basics and leveraging tools like OTP, Programming Elixir. Dave Thomas does a wonderful job of balancing approachability and clarity on Elixir, on Elixir concepts. Every chapter comes with hands-on exercises that build on each other from previous lessons and aren't overly complicated. Overall, I found this book crucial in forming a solid foundation for Elixir concepts and often found myself referring back to it even after my initial read-through. The later half of the book dives into OTP and distributed systems. I did find this section to be a bit confusing and it left a lot of room for questions, but it's still a good resource for OTP and beyond. Some of my other favorite resources for OTP is Pragmatic Studios Elixir and OTP. This was actually the first resource given to me to learn Elixir, but since I'm more of a reading kinesthetic style learner, I found this to be overwhelming at first. I revisited this course after I read most of the programming Elixir book and very much enjoyed it after I had a better foundation. I think it might suit some of you who have a stronger dis disposition for visual and auditory learning to replace programming Elixir with Pragmatic Studio. The other resource on this topic that is 100% worth the time and money spent is Bruce Tate's Professional Elixir and OTP course. I attended this course with a few other devs and came out of the course with all of my lingering OTP questions answered. I especially loved how there was a huge focus on keeping it simple and focusing on the design of your OTP application. Bruce's approach was great for pretty much all levels of devs looking to harness the power of OTP. And it's a fully immersive classroom experience, so it mimics on-the-job training. Moving to Phoenix Live View on our roadmap, Pragmatic Studios Phoenix Live View course is my number one. Despite not having a strong preference for videos, I really enjoy the clarity of the short videos and the fact that they provide you with all the CSS beforehand. So you only have to think about getting your app up and running. They also do a really good job of staying up to date on new releases um, even after you purchase it for free. The last item on our roadmap is probably the most important, testing. My favorite resource for this is Testing Elixir. I deeply enjoyed everything about this book and consistently refer to it when I have a question in testing. The authors do a great job of laying out best practices specifically for Elixir. If you want to level up as an Elixir dev, then this is a must read. I have a few honorable mentions. Fly.io and LaunchScout both have blogs that are a great resource for supplemental learning. And you'll find lots of Live View Phoenix related content on Fly and lots of Elixir related stories on LaunchScout. The Little Book of OTP is another great resource for solidifying OTP knowledge and Elixir in Action for a deeper understanding of scalability, concurrency, fault tolerance, and distributed systems. Okay, that's it. We've reached the end of our roadmaps. I hope this talk has given you a few takeaways to either help your new Elixir devs level up or you yourself become the splendid Elixir dev you were always meant to be. Thanks for having me here at the Elixir US conference and please come take a rubber duck if you would like one. <laughs>